We inspect workplaces anywhere, any day, any time, because we don't want anyone to have a really bad day. So if your workers aren't safe, neither are you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the lunch break. Thank you for coming back. I hope you had a chance to grab something to eat and hopefully get out and get some fresh air and stretch your legs. Um, the session, uh, the second session, an optional session here this afternoon is around manual handling, what's new, what's reviewed and what's there to do. So just before we start, of course I have some housekeeping that I need to run through. Um, we will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the session. Um, for those who are in here earlier, we'll have roving mics, so um, the team will be um, moving around and we'll be doing that at the end. So as we go through, if you've got any questions, um, please take note of those and we'll get a chance to do that at the end. As well as also we'll have an opportunity um, Alan is happy to answer any questions one-on-one -on -one afterwards as well. A call out again to the social media users in the audience, please be part of the online conversation and use our hashtag HSMonth in any tweets or your Instagram pics. Uh, to be respectful, please ensure your mobile phone is switched off or onto silent for the duration of the presentation today. And of course, in the event of an emergency, um, the staff will direct us to the nearest evacuation assembly area. So it's, my name, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Erin O'Donoghue. I'm a member of the WorkSafe Strategy 2030 team and I'm the MC for the session um, this afternoon. So I'm going to hand over now to Alan Duffett, who is the Senior Ergonomist in the Specialist Program and Licensing Division at WorkSafe Victoria. He's worked as an ergonomist with WorkSafe since 1996 and has provided technical input into many WorkSafe publications, including those associated with container packing, order picking, handling large bulky and awkward items and slips, trips and falls. So please join me in welcoming Alan. Some systematic reviews in 2010 and 2015 in reputable ergonomics and occupational medical journals looked at the effectiveness of manual handling training on, on the reduction of back pain and back injuries and found that it was largely ineffective. I'm presenting to you today about manual handling, what's new, what's review and what you need to do so you don't rely on manual handling training. If you're an employer or a worker or a health and safety rep, you have a role in identifying hazardous manual handling and controlling any risk at your workplace. This manual handling session will cover what's new in the, in the field, what's review, and what your business needs to do. So part 3.1, hazardous manual handling, is a new part of the new occupational health and safety regulations. We'll present that in detail, including in the requirements to review and revise the risk controls following a report of an injury. So you'll also learn how to conduct a manual handling risk assessment. I'd like to say using the new risk assessment and control myth, um, worksheet, but that's not quite ready yet. The hazardous manual handling compliance code will be sent to the minister uh, for approval mid this month, and we expect it to be published shortly afterwards. Um, and so that um, I can't present specific details, uh, but most of the slides I've got will come from that information. So what's new? Some statistics. Manual handling is still um, about 37.4% of all the scheme claims. So you can see there that represents about 19,600 claims per year have been associated with manual handling. But that has reduced from 38.2% in the previous year, which reflects to about 726 claims reduction uh, in the last 12 months. So that we have, we are reducing injuries 
due to manual handling in. Um, as you can see on the slide, the fully developed costs of the manual handling claim is about 67,000. What that means is the cost from the start of the claim till that person's returned to work and recovered fully. So it may, may be over a number of years. So what's new in the industry statistics? You probably can't see all those, but manufacturing has the highest number of manual handling claims. And it's around about 30, 36, 3,700 claims uh, in that time frame, which represents about 18.8% of all the industries. Healthcare and social assistance is slightly less, so it's 18.3 per cent, or so about 8 per Construction, still around 11 per cent. Now the transport, postal, warehousing, 8 per cent. The examples are road, rail, transport, water, water transport, couriers, ports, um, and warehousing services are all under that banner. Next one is wholesale trade, about 7.6%. About, uh, and that's the wholesaling of agricultural products, minerals, metals, chemicals, timber machinery. So a whole range of the, of the, warehouse, of the, um, the wholesale trade. The next one is retail trade, about 6.7%. And that's your classic retail stores. And public administration and safety is about 6.5%. And that's state, state and lo local government Prisons, police, emergency services. And the remainder is less than 5%. So specifically what's new in the regulations. In the old regulations, there were separate definitions for manual handling an object. But in the new regs, that's been, well firstly it's been changed to hazardous manual handling, from manual handling. And then it's redrafted to incorporate previous definitions of manual handling an object so that we we tried to simplify it to just make one definition. Uh, there's removal of the word sustained in relation to movements um, and the word repetitive. Is, so where we used to have sustained and repetitive movements, sustained and repetitive awkward postures, we've just taken out some of it. So, so it's, uh, we've taken out removal of the word sustained in relation to movements and uh, repetitive in relation to postures. Simple changes that, sorry, um, simple changes just to streamline the regulations. Regulation for hazard identification hasn't really changed. It was 3.1.1 and now it's regulation 26 which requires an employer to identify so far as reasonably practical any, take, any task undertaken by employee involving hazardous manual handling. The new regulations requires an employer to identify any hazardous manual handling undertaken or to be undertaken by an employee. Task has been replaced to encourage employers to focus on all the work that's being done. With the task, it was a narrow definition and in the past we've had Place both employers and, and inspectors looking at the narrow aspect of a task and drill, drilling it down so that it's, so, it's such a small part of the task, you're, you're losing the, um, the forest from the trees. So that we're now looking at the work involved and so it's the hazard identification of the, the whole work involved in that. There was a subclass um, 3.1.12 and that was hazard identification of a class of tasks. Um, that's been removed now, and that's because the, that, that information was considered more appropriate as part of a guidance material rather than in the regulation. So what's new in the compliance code which, when it comes out? And you can see that the, the risk management process is still in the compliance code. Um, it reinforces the risk management, approach, risk management approach to address hazardous manual handling, but now it includes that introduction of known risk controls, known risks and controls. Um, so what the point is there, if 
the work of one of your employees involves, um, requires them to carry heavy objects around the workplace. We know that that's a risk. Carrying is a risk, and the control measures providing a trolley is pretty simple. And so what we're saying now is that if you've got the risk and the control measures are there, go straight to it, put those control measures in place. If for some reason in your workplace you've got lots of steps, you've got tight corners and a trolley is not suitable, then you would go through that appropriate assessment process to look at the most appropriate control measures to put in place. But where you've come across simple control measures that can be put in place, put them in place straight away. Don't worry about going through the whole process. So in terms of the hazard identification sheet, which is pretty similar to the, the previous one, there is, you can see the last uh, column there, are there, or is there suitable risk control measures available now? Provide details. So it just goes through, if you're going through looking at the work that you do, seeing whether there's hazardous manual handling, the definitions of hazardous manual handling haven't changed except for a couple of a couple of words. So if they, those characteristics are present, it is hazardous manual handling, is there an appropriate control measure, tick it, and you can go and, and get those fixed straight away. So we're trying to make it a bit simpler and easier. The next part of it is we control the old control regulations. It is very similar, almost identical, We've got the hierarchy of control. Eliminate so far as reasonably practical. So that's the, um, that is always going to be the, um, the gold standard as it were. If you can eliminate, then uh, that's where we would look at it. Um, if any of you had a look at the, the uh, WorkSafe award winners, um, if you have a look at the, the, the MyGlass, um, uh, that was one of the winners, that's looked at handling very heavy window frames, installing them in workplaces, and they've gone through a process to provide appropriate equipment that actually eliminates the manual handling of those windows. So that's the highest level of control. And then you need to, if you can't eliminate, then you need to reduce it. And you can see that it's virtually the same by altering the layout, environment, systems of work, changing the Instead of old objects, it's now the things used, using mechanical aids or any combination. In the last, in the, the old regs, it was, if, that's not, if uh, that's not practical, the employer may use information instruction or training. There is a new reg in there, which is highlighted in red. So if the employer has complied with one and two, so that they've eliminated or not eliminated, it's not practicable, they've reduced the risk so far as reasonably practical by changing the mechanical aids uh, or any combination of those, the, and there is a risk remaining, then the employer may use information, instruction and training to reduce that residual risk. And so that, and this is not the manual handling training I was talking about at the, the front, it's not bend your knees, keep your back straight, that sort of stuff. This is specific training on how to reduce that residual risk um, remaining after the controls have been put in place. Um, and of course, when you're re relying on training and, in and instruction, the amount of supervision needs to be increased to that same level. You can see point, point four now is the, is the same as point three. If it's not practicable, the employer may use information, instruction or training if there is no higher order control measures put in place. But again, the amount of um, information, instruction and training will need to be very high to look at reduction of risk and it won't be the generic bend your knees and keep your back straight. If your inspectors were coming through, they will be expecting a, a, a training program, appropriate supervision, appropriate um, uh, reinforcement of those, of those procedures. And, and then the final section there is the same. There are certain factors that need to be addressed and they are the same as the, uh, the previous code.
So what's new in the compliance code? What we've tried to do, you can probably see this, this, this won't be in the compliance code, but this is something I drafted up to provide detail. So what we're trying to do is to provide further guidance so that when you're using the, um, uh, the method in the compliance code, if there are further information, um, if you need to drill into a bit more detail, then there are some other methods um, that are regularly used within the industry, or so if, within the ergonomics profession that you may be able to use. So the first one there, I'm not going to go through them all, but the OWAS, um, Avaco Working Posture Analyzing System, that looks specifically at posture and force and load. Now then, with that, it has the ability to predict risk controls. So that if you're going to look at putting in some controls, you can use a method like this um, in certain situations to predict what the level of risk was going to be once you've put those controls in. So you can look at before and after. And you can see there is a range of, of risk assessment methods um, that will look at posture, forces, uh, movement, frequency, some of vibration, duration, uh, and some psychosocial issues. So that if, you're, if you've got, if you've identified the, the organisational issues, uh, rostering, um, uh, workload, shift length, all those sort of stuff are issues that you need to address, this will lead you through to some further risk assessment methods to add to the compliance code method to assist you in working out what the best control measures are. These are all designed for you to identify what the best controls are to reduce the, your risk in this situation. And in most cases, you'll be looking at what the, the most productive control measures are so that you can also look at uh, those methods as well. The other thing that will is in there is um, a discomfort survey. Uh, and what we've found with a lot of workplaces is trying to identify before it gets to a claim, but having an idea from the work that people do, um, what discomfort may they be uh, coming from? So you can see that they, uh, they've got body charts and you've got, uh, do you suffer from swelling, numbness, tingling, pins and needles, stiffness or aches or pains in any part of the body? Indicate on the diagram where it occurs and rate the level of discomfort. Uh, and then what do you think caused the problem? So it gives the employers, health and safety reps, uh, a tool to say, well, this is, this is what's happening to the, the people doing this work, where do they think it comes from? And you can also use this um, pre and post intervention to see if there's been any changes. Um, so we're, find, we've, uh, we're finding that uh, tools like this uh, are very valuable to use in the workplace. Um, and you can do it over periods of time. With any of this sort of stuff, you want to sort of find out if um, at the end of the day you've got numbness, tingling, sore pain, uh, pains, and then hopefully if you do the same thing the next day, then your body's recovered and those things have gone away. But if you're doing it for long enough, then they may, those tingling or aches and pains may continue for the next day, or at some stage you get to it, it continues over the weekend, and so you're still getting the pain. So it gives you an idea of the sever severity, and it looks... It's a way of then identifying what are, the, what are the tasks, what are the work is doing that, so you can then um, drill down and, and look at that particular work. So that's a, that's a new part of the, the uh, compliance code. There is um, uh, still some, a little bit of change to the Reg 3.313, uh, which is the review and risk control. So an employer is required to review and, if necessary, revise the risk control measures in response to any of the... And there's seven triggers. I won't go through all of them. But what we've had is one trigger that's taken away, which is the trigger which requires a review or a risk control measure before an object for, is used for another purpose other than which it was designed. Or, 
we never knew how it was going to be used anyway, so it was one of those sort of redundant. And I'll go into a bit more detail about uh, the review of risk controls, but what we're finding within WorkSafe is that um, um, it is a good trigger. If someone's reported, in one of the cases, if someone's reported an injury, it's a good trigger to go back and have a look at what control measures in place. Are they working effectively? Are they still are they using it? And so that then you can see whether those control measures need to be upped or actually reinstated because they haven't been uh, they've been uh, gradually removed. So what is review? What we're talking about is a review, review of risk control measures, which is Regulation 28. And so that it states that an employer must review and, if necessary, revise any measures implemented to control risks under Reg 27. Look, we talk about numbers and all the rest of it, and it runs off by. But what it is is that there is, if you've got hazardous manual handling, and with a risk of an MSD, there is a duty for the employer to control it. And they put those control measures in place. And then if there's put control measures in place, this is the next part is to, to review it on certain situations. So that if there is alteration to anything, process or system of work, in including a change in the place where the work is to be undertaken, you need to re review those risk controls. Um, as I mentioned before, if you've, got, if you've changed workplaces, you're doing exactly the same work, but you change to another, um, another depot, another room, the control measures you might have had for using a trolley to move things, you, you've now got steps, you've got other ways, and so that you can't use those particular control measures just because you've changed the location where you're doing it. Um, one of the things, if um, uh, a lot of times, I'm thinking about production, but a lot of times, the purchasing area will get a great deal for what we used to be getting in 10 kilo bags, they now get in 25 kilo bags because they've got a great deal on it. But the people who have to, to lift those, it's the same product, but it's in different sizes. So again, you need to look at reviewing your risk control, taking into account those change in the materials or the objects that you're, that you're receiving. The next trigger is if new or in additional information becomes available. Um, now, that you might get that through the industry association, you might get it through the unions or other ways of doing it. But WorkSafe, we, we publish regularly information that we've gleaned from our inspectors and the industry about best ways of doing or better ways of, of doing things. Uh, some publication we put out recently is, is um, um, that I'm aware of is unpacking shipping containers. And so that's the methods for manually unpacking those. And so that that's, we expect that employers will keep up to date with that information. So the fact that you've been doing, this, doing it this way for 20 years doesn't mean to say that the industry hasn't changed and the expectation hasn't changed in that time. So it gives you an opportunity to, where you become aware of new information, is to have a look at your controls. Do they match with the expectations of your industry, um, your workforce and, and the regulator? The next one is a, if an MSD is reported on behalf of an employee. So that's a trigger that if you've got a claim, if you've got a report of an injury, it's a trigger for, for you in consultation to have a look at the control measures to see whether they are still appropriate. Um, WorkSafe's been doing a lot of work in this area um, and we'll do that by having a look at claims that have been reported by a workplace, looking at manual handling, and then our inspectors will go into that workplace and say, well, have you reviewed your controls? Someone's got an injury, what control measures do you have in place? Have you had a look at those control measures since the person's been injured to try and reduce the risk? So that's really one of the, um, 
as far as we can see, it's an ease, it's a good trigger to have a look at the controls to see whether the controls still match the risk. And after a notifiable incident, um, so I've been in the organisation a long time, there's not, not many notifiable incidents, but I went out to one about two weeks ago where someone was um, loading something into a car their back went on them, um, they couldn't move, the ambulance was called and they had to stay overnight in hospital. So that was a reportable injury. So that we went to the workplace to follow up on that incident. You know, one of the, the first, well, they're still doing the investigation, but one of the first questions are, well, what equipment did they have to take the objects to the car? Well, well there's a, a fold-up trolley that's somewhere <laughs> in the corner so that they are going to review their controls, looking at more state of knowledge trolleys that are available to, to do that work. And to assist in the review of risk control, we've put out a couple of guidance, some, some guidance material. You can see there's two publications there and they're available from our website. Um, Hazardous Manual Handling Review and Revision of Risk Control Measures. Um, and manual handling, improving the review and revision of manual handling. They sound the same, but one was developed as, um, as a straight review, provide guidance. But the second one, after, we, after inspectors starting to go to visit workplaces following uh, the report of an injury, we got that intelligence back from the inspectors to say, what's, what is needed out there? What additional assistance is needed by workplaces? And so we came up with this, with this second document. And we're also engaging a university researcher to provide um, guidance on that, on whether you call it accident investigation, incident investigation. Um, but what we're finding generally, and this is not um, specific to any, any one workplace, but what we're finding with accident investigation on manual handling, I won't say it's different, is that they ask the question why, 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 until they find out someone's done something wrong. Someone hasn't followed the procedure and that's the end of it. So they send them back for retraining, that's the end of the investigation. So they're not looking at what were the contributing factors, what were the system in, in place, what were the available controls, um, mechanical aids that could be used, it was just accident investigations until you can, sorry, until you can blame it on someone, in which case then you can retrain them. And I've been to a number of places to point out, um, if you like, the, the, not quite the ludicrousy, but they were telling us how ludicrous it was because the person that got injured was the supervisor or the, the manager of the area that does all the training for everyone. And so to say that they haven't followed the procedure just because they didn't follow the procedure. You have a look at the procedure. Why weren't they doing it? Why wasn't the equipment available for them to do it safely? What was the appropriate equipment for them to do it? Uh, and then you delve into a lot more deeply to find out what the control measures that are appropriate for that task. And then they quite readily see. Um, because a lot of times you're spending a lot of money on retraining someone. If you're working in a, um, you know, some of these will say supermarkets, you might have 15, 20 people that you've got to put through retraining because you think that someone didn't follow the procedures. And so that's a hell of a cost when it may have just been that you needed a $500 trolley to be available to do that work and they wouldn't have, they would follow it correctly. So what we suggest in these, in these um, uh, publications on how to review your risk controls. So one way to do it is firstly to list all control measures in place. So that you might have some trolleys available, you might have the training of people, you've got some SOPs or, or swims or whatever you, that you're doing. Um, and then you would look at does the risk, the risk remain? And if an MSD has been reported, what didn't work or go to plan, 
when, why, when, how, under what, what circumstances. Was it you couldn't do a team lift because everyone else had gone and you were the last person there? Um, was it that um, the items that you're team lifting are now are so much heavier because instead of going in the glass industry, instead of single glazed, you're looking at mainly double glazed units, so there's twice the amount, twice the amount of weight in um, Are there any barriers to fixing the issues identified above? Or, or are other, bar other barriers not identified? So that uh, the barriers might be that the room's not big enough to use powered equipment, so you've got to use manual equipment, so manual pallet jacks instead of powered pallet jacks or things like that. So review the risk controls against what is reasonably practical. And, and again, I sort of reinforce it. It's not we've done it this way for 20 years and we haven't had an incident. You might have been lucky for 20 years. Um, it is review it against what is reasonably practical for that, for that industry. What is the current state of knowledge about this task on risk control measures? And while we say that it's current, and it's not work safe current, is what is your industry current? What is the rest of your industry doing? Um, we'll, we normally know because we're visiting all your competitors and everything else, so we'll know what the state of knowledge is, but you really need to look that at it yourself. And do they eliminate the risk or hazard at the source? So if you can eliminate at the source, you've got better controls in place that, are long, that, that are a lot, will stand a lot longer than if you're just putting in band-aids in. Is it the highest level practicable? Remember our hierarchy of control, if you can go up, if you can eliminate, so it's fantastic, but otherwise you'd be looking at providing um, changes to the workplace, the, the providing appropriate equipment and so forth. And so do the, the risk control measures, give the employees the highest level of protection. So that, and then revise the risk control measures if need be. So that this is the second part of the guidance where we're looking at what, um, what may be in place which is commonly, commonly start with a focus on the things that have gone wrong in the incident. So that, and then often, in, so that you're drilling down to find someone who's not followed a formal rule or procedure. Um, so you can blame it on a person. And so that then you can look at retraining that person, counselling that person, getting rid of that person or whatever, because um, they didn't follow your, your, um, um, your train, or if you said training, retraining. But again, if there is a training issue. We would also look at it as a lack of supervision. So you can't just train people and not supervise them to ensure that they're doing that training. So that um, while you think it's, it's that person didn't follow follow procedures, we would also look and say, well, what are your procedures? Why are you why are you getting someone to do this and you're not supervising to ensure they do it? But the new way we're, we're, we're sort of recommending that is that you start with the risk control measures in place. So for what is required for things to go right in the work. So what have you set out? What controls are in place that you expect for the things to go right? Review all risk control measures rather than starting with the incident. Review them against the current state of knowledge, as I was mentioning before. And review the risk control measures for what is reasonably practical and effective at the workplace, and then implement that. In a lot of cases, the, the new equipment, the, the things that are available, will also look at increasing productivity, increasing quality, and doing other things uh, while you're doing it. So that consider when you are reviewing risks or reviewing control measures that you look the best for the business as well. So what as an organisation, as, as an employer, as a health and safety rep, as, a, as an employee, what do you need to do to address hazardous manual handling? Well, WorkSafe has, has been into collaboration um, for, for a long, long time. So that look at your health and safety committees, um, look at your health and safety reps, get them involved in anything that you do, uh, look at your other agreed arrangements, be they toolbox meetings, OHS items on agendas, procedures for reporting incidents and hazards, 
an opportunity to raise, to raise issues. If you're not reporting, then things don't happen. But as soon as you start reporting um, what's going on, you'll normally find that this is a, it's a quality, of, quality approach, that things get done. If you let people know, then, then that's a shared responsibility and, and people will, will do their best to try and get things done. So the first thing, identification of hazardous manual handling work. We've mentioned this before. So if you ticked any of the boxes up here, then the work involves hazardous manual handling and you should then determine whether there's a risk of an MSD. Unless you know that there are suitable control measures already available, you can put them straight into place. Then the next step for those people that go, go through the old compliance, the old code of practice, and there's very little difference between what we used to do, but you need to determine whether there's a risk of an MST. And you do that by determining what the postures, movements, forces um, are involved in doing the task. And so in this case, you'd be looking at, does the work involve any repetitive or sustained forces, awkward postures or repetitive movements? So remember, people that remember the old uh, risk assessment form, these are all the same for that. So is there bending or twisting of the back, forwards or sideways, more than 20 degrees? In most cases, if you can observe it, then, it, then it's, uh, it's gonna be a risk on the back. Is there visible bending of the back backwards more than five degrees? So the whole part of this is to, when you think about your, your spine, you're trying to keep your spine in a good posture, but if you're bending over, then it's the weight of your body and the object that you're doing that's going to cause the, the strain on the back. And so that, again, these, these uh, postures, movements and forces, if they're repeated more than twice a minute or they're sustained for more than 30 seconds at a time, these are where you would identify that. So bending of the neck forward, sideways, twisting of the neck, um, visibly bending of the neck backwards. If they've done more than twice a minute or sustained for more than 30 seconds at a time, that's a trigger then to identify that there is a, that they may be a risk. Working with one or both hands above shoulder height for 30 seconds or doing it repeatedly, bending forwards, sorry, reaching forwards or sideways from the body, reaching behind the body, excessive bending of the, of the wrist. These are all things that may lead to the risk of an MSD. Twisting, turning, grabbing, picking or wringing actions with the fingers, hands or arms, squatting, kneeling, crawling, lying or jumping, standing with most of the body weight on one leg. You think, where do you do that? But there's still a lot of old machines there that are foot operated. And so you've got to rest all your weight, your weight on, one, on one leg while you operate a pedal with the other. And that is fatiguing over time and can cause a risk. Um, and then lifting or, or lowering. Carrying with one hand on one side of the body, exerting force with one hand, pushing, pulling or dragging, very fast movement. It's where we, because it's not necessarily just the weight of the object. If you've got something light, light you think about a tennis ball, tennis ball's light, but if you're throwing it, then the likelihood of you getting an injury is quite high because of the force you've had to put on, put on that. So it's not just the weight of the object, it's what you're doing with that object. So you're doing things very fast, you're likely to have an injury. And exerting force in an awkward posture, so that those, those pushing or pulling, yeah, if you're twisting at the same time um, to see where you, see what you, that's also a risk. Gripping with the fingers pinched together or held wide apart, applying uneven, fast or jerky forces, holding, supporting or restraining a live animal or person, um, and People stick at live animal, but yeah, look, it's the unpredictability of, of something that's, that can move by, the, by themselves, um, and so that uh, that is where you're going to do fast, jerky movements because they've moved unexpectedly to you. So as a general rule, if any of those occur for more than twice a minute or more than 30 seconds of a, 
over time. If the workers perform more than two hours over a whole shift, or that work is continuous for more than 30 minutes at a time, we would say that there's a risk of an MSD, and therefore you will need to put some control measures in place. Now that hasn't changed from the last, um, uh, the last code of practice, but I'm just reinforcing that. And the next question is, does it in involve high force? Now, the definition of high force is it means an activity involving a, a single or repetitive use of force. There would be reasonable to expect a, a person in the, in the workforce, not necessarily in the workplace, but in the workforce, or particularly if there is someone in your workplace that you wouldn't get to do the job, that's an indication of high force. So that's a, that's a simple one. Um, so work invo involving high force can cause an MSD even if it's not repetitive or sustained. Just that single action can cause an injury straight, straight away. And high force is commonly associated with the handling of live persons and animals are low, and loads that are unstable, unbalanced or difficult to hold. So even though the object might not be that heavy, if it is long and is unpredictable, you're likely to do, you have to use high force to sustain that. But also high force can mean the part of the body. So that it might be, if you're, if you're reaching up high, the object that you're handling at a distance just using your shoulder muscle, the weight of that object would be a lot less than if you're trying to lift it um, close to the body. So that that's why we really can't put any weight limits on anything, it's because what part of the body are you using? Um, what is the distance away from the body that you're, d you're doing it? Because we all know that lever effect, that the further you are away from the body, the greater the, that lever action, the greater the strain that's putting put on the, on the, the, the muscles and ligaments. Um, and so that high force may involve work above, above head height, with smaller weights, it might involve um, adopting awkward postures to bend and twist to pick things up. Uh, and so that it's really, um, in most cases, it's, it's relatively easy. But we've just got to consider that, yeah, it might be high force for particular parts of the, of the body. And talk to you, that's where you're, um, the, uh, the job discomfort survey will also come in because if someone's saying they've got a sore shoulder and you can relate it back to handling the five or 10 kilogram box that is above shoulder height, that gives you an indication it's high force because you've got people that are reporting it and uh, the part of the body that you're using. And the next part is that if there is a risk of an MSD, are environmental factors increasing the risk? And so that will vibration, heat, humidity, cool, slippiness increase the risk? And so that we need to, uh, to look at that. So the next part is looking at there is a risk. What we mentioned before, what part of the work is causing it? Is it the workplace layout, the design, the position of the objects? Is it vibration, heat and cold, tidiness? Uh, lack of tidiness, so that you've got to be very careful where you're walking. The systems of work we talked about before, job design, staffing, work rates, job rotations, shift length, the tool design, the equipment design, and the mechanical aids. And so are they part, what parts of that can you identify are causing the risk? And then you need to eliminate it. Um, mentioned about one elimination, if it's not if it's not reasonably practical to eliminate, also the workplace layout, environment, systems of work, things used, mechanical aids, any combination of above. And if it's not reasonably practical, look at information, instruction and training. And that's a suite. It's not just bend your knees and keep your back straight. That is a suite of, of um, system there. And reviewing control measures. An employer must review and, if necessary, revise any control measures before an alteration is made to the thing, process or system of work, 
If new information becomes available, if an occurrence of an MSD is reported, after a reportable injury, and there's a couple of other reasons, and one includes if it, uh, after a request from HSR. You know that there alone, we do provide, we try to provide as much guidance as we can to assist you in um, controlling the risk and going to our website, talking to the, uh, um, the booth outside, what sort of publications are available. Um, these are uh, just some of, the, some of the ones that come from our unit so that it can assist you in, in controlling the risk. So, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for that fantastic and very comprehensive presentation. Um, just to note, because uh, I think there were some great tips in there, um, there's also the presentations will be available on the Health and Safety Month website um, in the next couple of days as well. So we're going to open the to the floor for questions now. Does anybody have a question that they were wanting to ask and happy to ask in front of the group? We've got our roving mic one here. Oh, fantastic, thank you. I noticed in the um, list of possible tools to use, like you had ruler and Nyash equation and those things, I don't know if I missed it, but um, the Michigan 3D um, program wasn't included. Is there a specific reason for that, or did I miss it? Um, it was in one of the iterations that I've that I developed, um, so hopefully you've missed it. Um, and I will check my notes here. Yeah, no, it's, it's 3D Static Strength Prediction Program. So that's in there. It's just not called... Yeah. OK, up the back there. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. One thing that's milling on my mind is the exercise in the, this place. There's four. Um, they are not up to date. And the two on my left, is uh, um, where's the doors? The doors should be more permanent. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we can't hear that properly up here. There was something about up, not up to date. The exit signs. The exit signs here. Oh. oh okay. All right. So we can bring that to the attention of the um, convention centre staff. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely pass that on. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Hi. Um, you're saying that there's going to be a manual handling tool released. Um, what's the name of that tool? Uh, the, um, uh, in, our, in the compliance code, you'll find a number of appendices. In, the, uh, in one of the appendices will be a list of other tools that will be... So we're not prescribing any tools. We're just saying, here is a list of recognised, if you like, ergonomic tools that may assist you, um, apart from the um, the risk assessment tool, that, which will come out very soon in the in the compliance code. Yeah. So it's um, it used to be part two of the uh, uh, of the old compliance code. That's you can still use that, but the new compliance code will also have um, a new tool. And when is it we're expecting that to be released, Alan? Um, well, it's, up, it's going to the Minister um, sometime this month and we hope it will be... Um, the Minister will approve it and it will be published pretty soon afterwards. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick question. You mentioned your discomfort survey. How do you tease out pre-existing problems that might be contributing factors to that discomfort? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, it is, it is a tool and hopefully the person, when they try and, and um, as part of the discomfort tool, how do they think they got that? Now, it might just be because they've, because they've got a pre-existing injury, because they've played footy at the weekend and that sort of stuff, but it's really, um, in one way, it will give you a prompt in terms, in terms of any return to work uh, and providing appropriate um, jobs uh, or ta uh, work for that person. 
so that it may or may not be used in, in, um, uh, in identifying particular... The aim of this is to identify particular tasks that may need to, or particular jobs that may need assessment. But a lot of times, I've also seen a similar thing used in a, in a distribution centre where they just had a big picture of a, of a body and people would put stickers on where they hurt. And that was, um, uh, that worked out quite well because when you get a number of people putting a sticker on, I've got a sore shoulder. Yeah, well, yeah, look, I get a sore shoulder after a while and I get a sore shoulder and, and all of a sudden you find that while people are putting up with it, when it, when it gets spread out to everyone, oh, yeah, I do get this. And then you can drill down into, OK, what, what part of the work do you think is aggravating it? And it might be that you're stacking the pallet up to above, you know, to, to above head height, and so there's, a, there's shoulder work there, um, and things like that. So that while it's it's not designed to be used as a, a, a tool to identify injuries in a person, it's just a broad tool. I think that can be used in various ways. Over this way, thank you. Um, with the diagram with the uh, area of discomfort, you had the full body front and back, the hand top and bottom. Why wasn't the feet included? Because uh, people get cramps. Um, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to check. I must admit, these, um, these have been put out for a long time and we've probably taken it from other... Yeah, the, the feet are there in, in terms of the whole body. Yeah, but... So you can... You can, you can uh, point the whole body, but a lot of times we find that um, uh, the hands are there because of repetitive strain injury, so that where people are getting um, carpal tunnel, where they're getting particular trigger fingers and things like this, having the hand there that they can mark it. Um, but otherwise, it's really, you would mark the foot, um, the knee. You get a lot of people with knee issues if they've got to climb up and down stairs. So, so you've had, uh, never had any issues with uh, repetitive going up and down ladders, safety steps, anything uh, like that? Yeah, if you're, if you're standing for a long period of time on a ladder, yeah, then, yeah, you, you would mark the foot and that would be where you come back to it and say, well, what do you think caused of it standing for a long period of time on a, on a rung ladder rather than, say, a platform ladder where you've got more space to put your feet? You're better at explaining them than I am. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just noticed there wasn't any mention of safe or standard operating procedures in, as, as a preventative action when we're doing manual handling. Um, what is the requirements these days for providing standard operating procedures when we're doing manual tasks? Um, there is the general duty under, under the Act to provide information, instruction and training. Um, and so that we, in the regulations, we try not to duplicate the duty that's in the that's in the Act. And so that um, yes, we expect that all the work that you're doing, there'll be some sort of procedures, standard work, um, swims, safe work procedures. Um, but when I was talking about specifically, I'm sort of thinking about manual handling training, um, uh, and that's where. Uh, I'm saying that's, that is the lowest level. But no, we, we expect everyone will have, depending on whatever work they do, will have their procedures that they need to follow. I may have missed this, so forgive me if I'm repeating you, but as far as lifting goes, years ago it used to be 10 kilos for a woman, 15 kilos for a man, all this sort of stuff. And then years later it was whatever you are comfortable to lift, you lift. Are there any kilogram rules anymore? Is it still whatever you're comfortable to lift, male, female, whatever, that's okay? What, what's the rules on that? There is, as I mentioned before, it's really difficult when we, um, we had that prescriptive legislation that was backing a long time ago. And it was, again from my memory, it was 15 kilos for children or people up to about... 15, it was about 18 kilos for uh, people up to eight, uh, up to about 18. And then there was a, uh, it might have been a, 
18 kilos for women. Tw yeah, and then, and then adults were about, uh, males were about 40 or 50 kilo, um, but nurses and police had no limit. So that it was a bit, um, yeah, it was a bit ridiculous to have those sort of limits. So what we said was that we'll take the prescriptive limits out. Um, as I mentioned before, it's really difficult to, there are anthropometric data, we can see strength data, and we know that for certain populations they've got a certain strength, but that is really how much they can handle in their best working zone. So it's close to the body with the object here, but as soon as you move it out, then you've got that moment and the amount of force that's going down on the back is different, and so it's really difficult. What we say is that keep things between your shoulder and mid-thigh close to the body, and um, in most cases, and again, it depends on the frequency you're doing it. If you're doing one lift, then it's a certain weight, but if you're doing multiple, then you've got that cumulative effect. Um, and so it is difficult, but some of the other tools in the further assessment tools, you can use things like um, the, the 3D, you can use the NIOSH lifting equation if you're just lifting. Uh, there's other, other ways to determine whether the, the weights that you're handling are, are reasonable for the, 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 the people that are doing the work. Okay, so we've got one down here. I think this is probably going to have to be the last question, just from a time perspective, so over to you. Yeah, uh, that's awesome about the uh, manual handling compliance code coming out. Thank you for that. Um, what's happening in terms of office-wise with the advent of mobile technology and sit-stand desks and... Um, micro desks and been lots of innovations in the last decade or so, but the OfficeWise uh, document doesn't quite reflect those changes. No, the OfficeWise documents come out a long, yeah, it was a long time ago now. Um, I did a review of it for the um, head, I'm trying to think, for Safe Work Australia about four or five years ago, WorkSafe were going to run with the, um, uh, with a harmonised document on that, but at the heads of government level, it, it sort of died off. Um, I've reviewed it recently. In most cases, the information in OfficeWise is still current. Um, the issues that I've got with it is that there are new office designs and uh, the traditional L-shaped uh, desk uh, and the, spa and the um, area around it is out of date because that was designed for s cathode ray tubes. You've got a huge piece of equipment in front of you. Um, you would have a corner desk because there was nowhere else on the, on the desk that you, can, that you can put it. Now, a lot of the new desks are straight desks because we've got these LCD screens that can sit a lot of the the new designs and, and WorkSafe are including that because we're moving down to Geelong and we're involved in that. And most of our desks now will be height adjustable and that's the standing height because of the additional work that's been done by the Baker Institute and others on, on that benefits of standing, which we didn't highlight that much in, in office-wise. We say change your posture, but really the... Um, you know, the it's coming around that most times in 30 minutes we expect someone to be maybe seated for 20 minutes, standing for two minutes, uh, for eight minutes, and then moving around for two minutes and trying to build that into it. So the next iteration of OfficeWise, whenever that comes, work from um, at the university, I think it's a, a Michigan, hopefully that work will go into it as well. And I think uh, just to add to that, just because um, we're working in the Strategy 2030 team, we are currently undertaking a, a big piece of work around looking at our entire guidance suite and understanding that there is um, some work to do there. So, um, and OfficeWise certainly has come up as a discussion. So, um, thanks for raising that and, and, you know, looking at our guidance generally is on our radar. So, thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Alan, very much. Please join me in thanking Alan for his presentation.
Um, as I said earlier, um, Alan has generously offered to um, stay behind um, for about 20 minutes before our next session to answer any questions you may have one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as always, we're up keen to have your feedback on our sessions, so um, shortly coming up on the screen, if it's not already there, is the link to provide us with feedback and the QR code if you would like to scan that. So your next session starts at 2.50, so you have 20 minutes. Thank you.
Peace to 